Uh, we talked about watch our words, power of words, generosity, finances. Thinking that all four of those things are going to be very, very, very big, key for in, into 2022 for us to walk in the freedom that he's called us to walk in. Now, when you start to preach a message like that, and I start talking about words and the power of words, and I said, no, uh, um, hmm, what is that word that should have, huh? Sarcasm, good grief. See, right now, it's far from me. <laughs> I don't want to even speak that word. So after talking about that, preaching about that on Sunday morning, it's like sometimes we have to be careful to pull the beam out of our own eye before we look at a speck in somebody else's eye. Just like, and a lot of times you're going to end up hearing, knowing, beginning to realize that when you watch the preacher get up there and start preaching about something that might be a pet peeve or might be something that, that he really seems to hammer on a lot, it might be something that he or she, a struggle that they have of their own. It's like, or it's a pet peeve. And a lot of times a pet peeve we have is something that we struggle with and it just drives us crazy when we see it in somebody else. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Well, it's confession time for just about five days after preaching that message, not just about, exactly five days after preaching that message. Had a couple of guests at our home, or a guest at our home. There were four of us there. And we had just finished eating just an amazing, amazing meal of two pizzas that we picked up down at the local <laughs> pizza shop. And Renee was doing some serving, and she, she ran to, she said, anybody want ice cream? I said, I do, I do, I do. I would like some ice cream, and uh, I want coffee. Do we have coffee? I want coffee in it. It's like, okay, well, she's gone. She took off to go, to go get that accomplished. And, and she brought it back, and from my perspective, I was thinking that she would be bringing ice cream, where I like three quarters of a cup of ice cream, one quarter of a cup of coffee, where you stir it all up, and it's just like a little bit of coffee-flavored ice cream, if it's good, strong coffee. And I like my coffee good and strong. So she ended up serving it to me, and, and, and I looked in there, and it's like, there's one scoop of ice cream and three quarters of a cup of coffee. It's like... <laughs> and I said, very quickly... We've been married 31 years. <laughs> and there are several waitresses downtown that know what I want more than you do. <laughs> How dumb was that? <laughs> she didn't say anything for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized Saturday morning, which would be Yesterday morning, when I woke up, it's like, oh, are you kidding? You really did that? Got a real, a real check in my spirit because I realized that what I had said was exactly what I preached against. It's like, and you did that? Yes, you did. I felt very checked in my spirit. So what do you do when you make a mistake like that? It's like, Ask forgiveness? No. You've got to figure out somebody else to blame. <laughs> well, read Genesis. What, what did Adam do? It's like, it's that woman you gave me. Like, she should have known. No, 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 that's not what you do. I think if you, if you show up for uh, the Wednesday night class, it's amazing. You know, the dynamics of Matthew and Tessa teaching together, it's awesome, great class, but he talked about triangulation, victim mentality, blaming somebody else, you know, that's so easy for us to do, but I would encourage you to come on Wednesday night, that's an amazing class, first, first one was really, really good, and those guys are doing a great job, so no, I, no, I, I am smart enough, I've been married long enough uh, to... Think about that for a second. Now, think about that overnight. Think, oh my word, you really messed up. So the first thing that I did is we started up a conversation and I said, you know, I really messed up and I, I am really sorry. I was trying to be funny. Would you forgive me? And there was just a 
bit of a hesitation there for a little bit. Like, and then it was, yes, 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 I forgive you. So, and then we had a few other things to talk about. Um, if you want to know just how closely you are to being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ as you walk on the earth, just ask your wife. She said, Bubba, you got a ways to go. <laughs> so I stand here forgiven. I'm ready to bring a, a message to you this morning. Um, I thought I was going to be bringing a, a message about forgiveness, and the more that I dug into and the more that I studied, there, this is an amazing message of forgiveness, but it has so much more. It actually covers all four of the things that, we, that I talked about just briefly last Sunday. So I want to try to hit some high points and try to get through about eight chapters of Genesis. And if that doesn't work, I will stop. And we'll still have a fire tunnel at the end. It might be 12.30 or so. But no, no, we're going, to get, we're going to do great here. We're going to do great. Are you ready for the first one? You know, and part of, I think the message, the, the title to my message will be The Untold Story. The Untold Story. Sometimes there's, you know, there's beginning and the, and the end, and there's some stuff that's left out in the middle a little bit, and, and we're going to get to that. And, and I hope that you're going to be taking some notes this morning because there's some really powerful stuff packed into this. We're only going to go through about 10 pages, so I would encourage you this week I'll say that right now. Last week I encouraged you to read James, Peter, and, and all three of the John chapters there. How many did that? Oh, awesome. Uh, 10 out of 300. That's not bad. Uh, that's over 10%. So, one of the amazing things, we think of this 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 kingdom of God and, and the, the, the church realm and the spiritual realm, so oftentimes it's been created, looked at as a man's world. It's the men. It's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But I want to talk a little bit this morning about some of the women, particularly Isaac's wife. Now, when Abraham was ready for his son to have a wife, he sent his servant to go pick his son a wife. Now you have to remember that Abraham had a beautiful wife, Sarah. Even when she was 90 years old, there were people that looked at her and said, oh man, is she hot. So, it would only be right for Abraham to make sure that his servant would go choosing a wife for his son that was equally beautiful, wouldn't you think? I mean, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Like, legacy, good-looking kids. So, he sent his servant, and I want to just try to hurry this part. This is an amazing and an incredible story just in itself, but he sent, Abraham sent his servant to choose a wife. So, the, what, everything worked out. Uh, the servant's prayer was answered as he went. He met Rebecca at, at a well, and at that well, uh, the things happened. He put out a fleece before the Lord. You know, have this girl come up to me and ask me if I want water. Sure enough, it happened. He picked her, found out that, yes, yes, and all of this worked. He went to the man's house with him and said, uh, yeah, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to take your daughter so she could end up marrying my master. Sounds like quite the, quite the way to find a wife, huh? And they, they, they thought about it. It's like, oh, well, you are a relative. Okay, yeah, this, this probably could work. So it all happened. And so they said, why don't you stay here for at least 10 days so we can have 10 more days with our daughter, you know, kind of get to know you a little better and all. And this, this is all in Scripture between chapters 24 and chapters 33 in Genesis. So you can go back and read this story. You can study on some of this yourself and go, oh, huh, yeah, he was right. Um, so he said, oh man, I can't wait 10 days. I need to get back to my master. And so they said, well, okay, well, you know what? 
we're going to call our sister down, our my daughter, his sister, down, and we're going to let her decide if she wants to go with you or not right now. So they called her down. They ran this situation by her, and she said, yeah, I'll go with him. So the brother, Laban, this name is going to pop up again here pretty soon, the brother Laban ended up speaking blessing over his sister. It's like, it can be pretty important, the blessing of a brother over his sister. Where's Luke? Did you hear that? The blessing of a brother over his sister. So they blessed Rebekah and said to her, verse 60, chapter 24, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Hmm. Process that word. This is the word that I believe Laban, maybe there's another brother or two, because it says they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. So a thousand thousands is a million. What's a thousand ten thousands? A billion? Uh, mother of many, 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 many. May your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. We're going to move a little, little fast forward. Like I said, I'm going to be kind of scrambling a little bit here. Go to we're going to go to the. So she was married to Isaac. Uh, they, they they became married, and she Rebecca was barren for twenty years. Twenty years, no kids. Uh, Isaac called upon the Lord for, for, for his wife, and she became pregnant. We're going to start then with verse 22 in chapter 25. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I this way, Lord? She went to inquire, inquire from him, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So she has received a word of blessing from between her father and her brother that they spoke over her. This is going to happen to you. So she has that word to ponder. This is the word that comes directly from the Lord. For her, to her. The Lord said to her. To who? To Rebecca. Two nations are in your womb. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Verse 24, so when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. <laughs> he was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Sounds like a really pretty baby, doesn't he? Mm. Red and hairy all over. <laughs> hmm. Well, afterwards, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So Isaac was 60 years old when he had his firstborn. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob. Everybody say, but Jacob. Hmm. So, a skillful hunter, a man of the field, a man after his father's own heart, was the hairy red guy. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So everybody, everybody, just think about this. Isaac was the man's man. He liked to hunt. He liked to fish. He liked to play football. I mean, he was a man's man, like an athlete. And he was a hairy beast. And it was red. <laughs> kind of like some of my family. Uh, 
No, I don't mean hairy and, and, and beastly. I just mean red. Okay. So Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. You know, he fixed him food. He killed game. He was the, he was the man's man. And Rebekah loved Jacob. He was the mild one. He hung out in the tents. Now, so Jacob was loved. He was the mama's boy. He hung out with his mother who had already had two words, right, that she's going to be a mother of thousands of ten thousands, that people that are guarding the gates are going to end up hating her and, and her descendants. So Jacob, hanging out with his mom, he's learned to cook pretty well. He's hung out around the tents and, and uh, minding his mother. Let's just say minding his mother. And Esau came in from the field one day, and he was we- weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. Birthright. Something that we have to realize and think about. The birthright at that time, firstborn male, got double of everything that anybody else would get. Double portion. Firstborn got double portion. So that means he's going to have to give up his birthright, the double portion, and the baton would be handed to him. When dad dies, he's going to be the, the man. He's going to be the king. He's going to be, become the patriarch when, when dad passes away. What do you call that when somebody, somebody passes away and the one that handles the money in the like, funeral time? Executor, executor. Yeah, he's going to become the executor of his dad's estate. In charge of everything and have a double portion of everything. So this is what Esau's giving up. So we start to learn a little bit about his character. Man, he's a man's man. He likes to hunt, fish, go out. And he likes to come in and say, I'm hungry, feed me. Now that's a man's man, right? (laughs) And willing to actually give up his birthright for that. So I'd say that his his decision-making is spontaneous, self-indulgent, looking for instant gratification. I'm hungry, feed me now. It has little to do with what the future looks like. I'm not worried about taking care of my future. It's like a, a lot of times that's a generation that we have become. I want it now. I want instant gratification. And man, I have a credit card. It's easy to get credit card. I can have it now and pay for it later. I'm not going to worry about that. I want it now. Everybody hearing me here? Okay. The I want it now. Spontaneous, self-indulgent. I want it now. I'll pay it later. Where his brother is more of a sacrifice now. Let's figure this out because I want a bright, bright future that I don't have to end up. Okay, that's probably enough of that. So Esau says, as we continue on, verse 32, he said, look, I'm about to die. So what profit is it going to be, this birthright thing to me? And Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. Jacob gave Esau the bread, the stew, lentils, and he ate, drank, arose, went his way. Thus Esau has despised his birthright but didn't value his birthright. He's like, that's not a big deal to me. I just want to eat right now. I want it now. I'm not worried about the future. Yeah. Mm. Character, character, character. So we're, we, as we move forward, knowing that, that Jacob now has the birthright because... Uh, a deal has been struck. A deal has been made. He sold it for, for, the, for the bowl of stew, for some self-indulgence, spontane. I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. As we move on, we're going to go to, we've talked about the inheritance of the firstborn, the double portion. So all of these things Jacob is already in alignment for. Now, when if Jacob was 60, not Jacob, if... Isaac was 60 when his sons were born to him, and 40 years later, Esau is married. So Jacob is how old? 60 and 40 is? 100. Like, wow, he, he's already getting a little bit old by the time his, he's going to be ready to have these grandkids, right? 
So he, <laughs> we're going to go to verse 30, chapter 26, verse 34. Fast forwarding a little. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. They drove them crazy. A grief of mind. They drove them absolutely nuts. Today we would say they were a, they were a pain in the rear to those guys. <laughs> a grief of mind. It's like, oh, why in the world did you pick wives that are from a different culture, that have a completely different belief system than we do, and you picked them for wives? They're driving us crazy. So they were not at all pleased. And Esau... I'm, I, Again, Isaac was 100 years old, so he was not a young man. I can just imagine his patience was very much tried. Now, verse 27, chapter 27, verse 1. I am trying to hurry here. Now it came to pass, when Isaac was old, and his eyes were so dim he could not see. I'm not exactly sure what old, it's somewhere over 100 by now. Uh, living with this, these two daughters-in-law that are driving him crazy, driving his wife crazy, which makes him even more crazy because he's living with a wife who's been driven crazy. You're married, you know what I'm talking about. And now it came to pass when he was old and his eyes became dim, and he called Esau his older son, who still, from his perspective, was the one who should be receiving the birthright, and the most powerful first blessing. Everybody with me? That should have been Esau. As far as Isaac's concerned, that's Esau. He called him to him, his older son, and he said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. He said, Behold, now I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, your bow. Go out to the field and hunt some game for me. Make me a savory food such as I love. You know what that is. And bring it to me that I may eat it, that my soul may bless you before I die. My soul may bless you before I die. It's like, this is not just a head blessing. This is not just a, a trivial, quick blessing. I'm going to bless you from the depths of my soul, son. Are you with me? That my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebecca, she's had two prophetic words spoken over her. One came directly from the Lord. One came prophetic word from her brother and dad who were hearing from the Lord. It certainly sounds as such. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went out to the field to go hunt game and to bring it back. So Rebecca went to her son Jacob, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying... Bring me game, make me food. And so she, she's is telling her son what she heard, and she's concocting this amazing, incredible plan that surely doesn't sound like it should work. doesn't really sound like it should work even to Jacob, but he's listening to his mom. And his response, verse 12, in chapter 27, verse 12. Perhaps my father will feel me, Mom, if, if, if we do this. If I get goat skin and put goat skin on my hand and goat skin on my neck, everywhere Dad's going to touch or kiss, goat skin, yes, goat hair, but, uh, and feel, what, what if he realizes that I'm a deceiver and he might curse me instead of blessing me, Mom? His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son, only this, obey my voice. Your mom ever told you that? You better obey me right now. I've talked about doing the mother-son dance with my mom. She's the one that would bring most correction. She's like, hey, I, I told you. And when I messed up, she would take her left hand, grab my left hand, and she would use her right hand with a belt, and we would begin to dance. <laughs> That was the mother-son dance that I danced with my mom on a semi-regular basis. 
obey my voice. So, go. Obey my voice and go. Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to grab some, something that's close and quick. We're going to prepare it really well. Plenty of spice. We're going to fix up a meal that I know your dad likes. I've been cooking for him for nearly 100 years now, 80 years or so. You know, it's a, a long time. I, I know what he wants. I'll, I'll cook it up. You pretend to be your brother. This is going to work. Go. Obey me. So he did. He went. He obeyed her. And Jacob went in to his father after the meal was prepared, said to his father, uh, Jacob said to his father, verse 19, 27, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me, Dad. Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found this game so quickly, my son? And he said, oh, Dad, the Lord God brought it to me. And Isaac said to Jacob, please come near me that I might feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near, like, oh, dear, oh, dear. Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of a hairy beast, or the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, but his hands were hairy like his brother's. So he blessed him. And he said, are you ready, my son, Esau? And he said, yes, I am. He said, bring it near to me, and I will eat my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. It's like, I need to get full, I need to get happy, and you're going to have the full blessing of my soul, son. So he brought him near to him, he fed him, gave him some wine, he drank, and the father and his father Isaac said to him, come now and kiss me, my son. He came near him, kissed him, he smelled the smell of his clothing, and his mother had chosen the right clothing, so it smelled like a man. I had a little grandson that used to come out. He was about four or five years old, and he'd go, I smell like a man. <laughs> so Jacob was smelling like a man to his father. So he came near, he kissed him, he smelled him, and he blessed him. He says, surely the smell... <laughs> Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you. Let nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Now, think back. What were the words that Rebecca heard? The same kind of blessing that's being spoken over him right now. It's like, huh, I already heard these words. I already heard these words. I need to do whatever I can do for him to get the right blessing. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Like, oh. Then it happened just as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and he got out of there. He'd scarcely gone from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food, brought it to his dad, and said, Dad, arise, eat of what I have prepared for you. I'm giving the short version now, that your soul may bless me. I want your soul's blessing. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac began trembling exceedingly and said, Who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me first? I ate all of it before you came, and I've blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. Power of words. Power of words. The power of the prophetic words, a word that's received from the Lord, passed on, hands laid on, the power of those words. You know, dads, moms, both, how important it is that we bless our children, that we speak positive, blessed words, words of blessing. 
over our children. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry. He says, Father, bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Esau's reply was, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. It's like, oh, we talk about that triangulation. He's the bad guy. He took it away. It's like, no, you gave it to him. You handed it over. Rather than think about your future, you handed it over for a bowl of, a bowl of stew. This makes me think when I, when I think the financial things. I remember somebody that I was, I was trying to mentor oh, probably 30, 30, 35 years ago when uh, a young man in his early 30s at that time. And I, I said, I was trying to tell him the importance of, of putting money aside. Uh, in fact, he had a house at, at that time. And hanging on to that house, a rental house. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. No, no, no. There's things I want to do. There's things I want to have. I remember him saying, I said, man, if you will just hang on right now, invest and hang on, invest and hang on. He said, no, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn. I said, yeah. He said, I'm young. I want to live life while I'm young. He said, when I turn 50, if I have to, I'll go flip hamburgers then. Kind of funny that you think 50 is old when you just barely turn 30, but man, how quickly that comes, huh? Same kind of thinking that the Esau had. It's like, yeah, I'll worry about that later. You know, I'll worry about that later. Not, not now. Esau said he he he's rightly named. He he he's messed with me. He stole this. He took that. And Isaac answered and said to Esau, "Indeed, I've made him your master. All his and all his brethren I've given to him as servants. Wine, grain. He's been well sustained." So what shall I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me, father. He lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth. You're going to live out in the wild. And of the dew of heaven from above, by your sword you shall live. You shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Does everybody here know what a yoke is? Yeah, it's like, I have picture, in fact, I've even had a couple of them because I thought they were really cool, the, the old the yokes, big leather collar that they put around a neck, and then it straps to another big leather collar, so two, two oxen, two horses, whatever, or one big leather collar that, that, that goes around, that somebody with reins is directing, you know, because it, it, it pulls, does all the work. And it says it, really clearly right here that it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So he's wearing Jacob's yoke on his neck. So who's got control of his life? Jacob, because he's wearing Jacob's yoke. Jacob's got the reins in. Everybody with me? It's like, okay, well, as we fast forward again, I'm going to say, you know, the missing parts, the missing parts. Uh, after, the, after Jacob had pulled this off, Esau was so, 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 so angry, so angry. Verse 41, so Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him with. And he said in his heart, these days of mourning, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So he is so angry, so, so, so angry with what Jacob's done. Half of it was his own fault. The other half was not. So angry that he wants to kill his brother. So as soon as his dad has passed, the days of mourning are over, his plan's to kill his brother. Everybody with me? 
That's what it, okay. And the words of Esau, her, the older son, were told to Rebekah. So somebody was listening. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, to her. Said to him, surely your brother Esau comforts himself. Everybody say comforts himself. He made himself feel better because he was so caught up in having revenge against his brother that he comforted himself in hating him, knowing and planning that he's going to kill him. Let's think about that for a second. That's something that we can... I remember working in, again in Celebrate Recovery and working through, you know, through forgiveness issues with a lot, a lot, a lot of people and, and finding that, that some people found, found solace and found comfort in extreme... Anger, thinking about what would I do, what could I do, how could I do it. You know anybody like that? You've seen it, you've heard it, you've probably even done it for a little while. Somebody that's made you so mad, that hurt you enough, disappointed you, whatever, that, that your thoughts were so focused on getting even, not necessarily physically killing, but getting even that you found some comfort in that. Everybody's just looking at me a little bit funny. Anybody been there? Yeah, lots of people. Okay, a lot of, lot of people. A lot of us have been there. I, I've been there for before where I, I felt like I was so cheated, so, oh, oh, that I really would go back and think about that and, and find almost an exhilaration in being so mad and thinking, what, what, I would love to just knock their, punch their lights out, run that scenario through your head. Come, yeah, now I'm finally seeing some heads shake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would love to. Ooh, that, that, that brings some comfort to me to think about. But that's not what we're instructed to do. We are instructed to forgive. Forgive. Even if somebody doesn't ask forgiveness, we're instructed to forgive. There was a situation that came up in, in, in my life where I don't really even have kind of time to go into any detail, but where someone tricked me, really tricked me good, in a real estate deal, looking for a partnership, then completely cheated me, didn't do what they said they were going to do at all. It's the last partnership I was ever a part of. And then I started feeling convicted because of how I ended the partnership and ended the thing, so I called him to go have lunch with him once I had started, celebrate, started leading Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> Not just started, so started leading Celebrate Recovery and felt a little guilty, even though the one I was... I was the one that was wronged, so I asked him to lunch, and say, and, you know, and, and we had this conversation, and I said, you know, the way that I felt, the things that I said, the way that I ended this partnership, I just want to ask you to forgive me for that, with the full expectation that he would say back to me, you know what, I'm really sorry, Lynn, about what I did to you. Instead, he said, I forgive you, and then he stood up and left, and I was like, That didn't work out like it was supposed to. That didn't look, work out like it was supposed to. There was full expectation on my part that there was going to be reconciliation because he was going to ask me for forgiveness as well. But nope. Yeah, I forgive you. Like, so that made it worse because I had an expectation in that relationship that <laughs> once I humbled myself to forgive him, but I wasn't really humbling myself because I had an expectation from that. We're called to be the ones that can humble ourselves, that can truly forgive. Okay, moving forward. Would you guys be good if I take like another 10 or 12 minutes? Because it's noon. Okay. Then I'll continue talking fast. Now, Rebecca gets her boy... And says, he, he is intending to kill you, my son. Verse 43. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Again, his mother, obey my voice. Don't even question this. Arise, flee to my brother Laban. Ah. Go to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away. And so he did exactly that. Stayed there that few days. was 20 years. 20 years. 
20 years was the few days. But while he was there, there's, I just encourage you to read this. This is such amazing, good, good stuff. But, and Rebecca said, after she sent her son away, go to my brother Laban and hang out there. You be there. It's a good, safe place. And Rebecca said to Isaac, then she went into her husband and said, I'm weary of my life because of the daughters around here. These, these two women that my son has married, that Esau has married, are driving me crazy. We surely do not want Jacob to marry one of the women from around here. So let's send him off to go be with my... Just a little bit of manipulation. Let's send him off to go be with my brother. So Isaac called Jacob, blessed him, and charged him, saying to him, You shall not <clears throat> excuse me. You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. <clears throat> Don't take one of these local gals. Doesn't matter what they look like. Do not take one of them. <clears throat> Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, of your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. It's like, we do not encourage you to be marrying a cousin these days. But this was fully approved. All right, go do it. It's going to be the right culture. It's going to be the right woman. And, and let, let's just... Keep this going. Find somebody really beautiful when you get there. May God Almighty. So he's speaking another blessing over his son. Rightly speaking, another soul blessing over his son. May God Almighty bless you. Make you fruitful. Multiply you. And may that you may be an assembly of peoples. And give you the blessing of Abraham and to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. And, and if you remember the blessing that Laban and her brother spoke over Rebekah, so close to this one right here, another prophetic word that's being spoken to Jacob, Rebekah's son. Is this all tying together for everybody? Okay. So Isaac sent Jacob away. He went there, found Laban, found Rebekah, ended up working there. He's found a, found a safe zone, went to work. And after a month of working there, Laban came to him. He said, just because you're a relative, you can't be working for free. I'm going to have to start paying you. He says, how could I... I'm not going through all of the details. You're just going to need to read some of this. How can I pay you? Name your wage. You're doing a great job. Name your wage because I want to pay you. And he said, that one's beautiful. I, I want Rebecca to be, uh, R Rachel. I want Rachel. I want Rachel to be my wife. I'll work for you seven years if you'll give me Rachel to be my wife. Deal. Deal, deal, deal done, deal struck, handshake. So he worked seven years and he didn't get Rachel. He got Leah. In fact, let's. We're in verse, uh, chapter 29. Verse 15, that's what I just covered, down to, down to 17. Rachel was the younger, had two daughters, and he asked for, he made the bargain, made the deal, seven years for Rachel. Now, verse 17, Leah's eyes were delicate. Hmm. Are we looking for delicate eyes? Uh, no, that's not exactly what he was looking for, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance, not just delicate eyes. Now Jacob loved her, and he said, I'll serve you seven years for her, 
At the end of that seven years, though, he received Leah. Now, as the story goes, he said, oh, you tricked me, you tricked me, you tricked me. He spent the first night with Leah, said, you tricked me. He said, okay, here's the deal. You give me another seven years, and I will give you Rachel as well. So that's what happened. He, he received Rachel, but back as he was, as he was leaving, you know, I, I got myself in such a rush, I forgot something really, really important. Uh, when Jacob spent his first night out, when he was sent off and spent his first night out by himself, we're talking about the gentle guy with no hair, that whose mom was a mama's boy, spent his first night out by himself just with his backpack, that angels came. He had that first night, he had a dream. Angels came, ascending up and down the ladder, and he saw that, and he goes, whoa, I am right here in the place of God, in the presence of God, and I didn't realize it. Didn't realize that. So then he heard the Lord speak to him and said, I'm going to go with you. Your descendants will be many, as many as the sand, and I'm going to protect you. I'm going to go with you. And Jacob then made a deal with the Lord. He said, if you will go with me, if you will protect me, if you will bring me back to this land that's been promised to my father and my grandfather, he said, if you will go with me and protect me, I promise you, I'll make a covenant with you that I will give you 10% of everything as a tithe of everything that you give me. Wow. So, as Jacob had been faithful in that, faithful in the years that he spent working for Laban, God incredibly, incredibly blessed him. But tithing is definitely not a New Testament, New Testament covenant. It's something that was done early, early on. And in that tithing, Jacob was incredibly blessed. He was protected. And we're going to move now going to skip some of the ways that he was blessed, that, 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 that God spoke to him, that the Holy Spirit was leading him, directing him in how he would end up raising flocks and, and uh, just some amazing things that happened that you need to read because it's just too cool not to. But <clears throat> Jacob is now taught, he, he's ready to leave Laban with God has so blessed him that he has flocks, he has servants, he has shepherds. Uh, he's got now four wives, well, two wives, two, let's just say four wives, a bunch of kids. He's got servants, shepherds. He is a force. He's got, he has accumulated like crazy. He served 14 years for his two wives that were promised to him, six more years. And in those six additional years, he was exponentially blessed. God just blessed him, blessed him, and blessed him. So he's ready to leave. And when he leaves, he's ready to go back to the land that God has promised Abraham and Isaac. So, are you with me? Okay. On the journey back, the thing that he has to remember, I have a brother back there that I haven't seen for 20 years, but the last time I saw him, he wanted to kill me. Is everybody with me? How exciting would that be? Even though you have all of this wealth, you have accumulated all of this, you have to go back now and face the brother that wants to kill you. Who is a man's man who knows how to use a bow, who knows how to fight, who knows how to use a sword? So what's probably going to happen to you when you go back and meet your brother? It's probably not going to be good. It's probably going to be really scary. So, so he was going back thinking about this whole time, the dread of what's going to happen when I meet my brother, the dread of what's going to happen when I meet my brother. <clears throat> he has all of his family, all of his flocks, his whole fortune, he, <clears throat> moving with him, and they come to the river. He ends up taking his flocks, taking his people, moving everybody to the other side of the river. He goes back and waits on his own. While he's there, that night, an angel comes to visit him. Once again, this is time number three 
that Jacob has, as you read through this, you're going to find that Jacob has had an encounter with an angel or angels. And, the <clears throat> and so Jacob ends up having a, a, a prayer time. And he's praying. It's like, oh, the messenger returned to Jacob, said, we've come from your brother Esau. He sent a messenger across, a spy, kind of a messenger, to go find Esau. He went and found Esau and said, your brother has 400 soldiers with swords. Like, oh boy, this is what I get to meet. 400 soldiers with swords. So Jacob was greatly afraid, distressed. He began to divide all of the flocks up. And then he went to sleep. He, he moved him across. He went to sleep and got this angel visit. Now, when this angel came to visit, he ended up wrestling with this angel until the breaking of day, like all night long. Realized that he was with an angel, and he, when he, the angel, or the, or the presence of God, saw that Jacob did not, <laughs> that he was not prevailing, that Jacob would not let go. He was going to hang on to him. He touched his socket. Jacob's hip went out of socket as they wrestled. And he said, he, the presence of God, the angel that was there, spoke to him. He said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You know, sometimes when when we're in a situation, in a scary, in a difficult situation, where we have to stay in the presence of God, and we have to hang on through that presence of God until we end up feeling the peace and the breakthrough to know and have the answer that He has for us. He said, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go until you bless me. I need that blessing. I need the answer. Jacob asked him, it's like, what's your name? And he said, what? why are you asking my name? Your name is no longer going to be Jacob. You won't be the supplanter anymore, but your name is going to become Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. See, sometimes it's, it's hanging on. It's praying through the night, hanging on, prevailing with God until breakthrough takes place. Maybe it's more than just the night. Maybe it's hanging on and continuing, hanging on, praying. It's like, God, I'm not going to quit until you bless me. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in the morning, Jacob went across. He, he, he lined everybody up, the least important to him, First, just in case his brother just started slaughtering people. That's going to start with the least important to me. And then they get to me, maybe I can get away. <clears throat> but here's what happened. You know, there's, Jacob lifted his eyes and he looked. And there Esau was coming towards him. With him, 400 men. So he divided all of the people up. <clears throat> he crossed over. And when he got close to his brother, he crossed over and then he began to bow. He bowed seven times in front of his brother until he came near. And then Esau began to run to him. And he ran to him, met him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him. Together they wept. Lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children and all that, that, that Jacob had. And he goes, wow, what, what is this? Who is, this is my family. This is my family, and all of this stuff is a, is, is a gift for you. And, and, and his brother Esau said, I don't need your gifts. I am so good. It's just glad to end. I'm just glad to be reconciled to you. This is awesome. It's amazing. And I want you to know that I love you. He wept on his neck, and I just hugged him. And I'm thinking, well, what's the middle of this story? I want you to just think back with me that there was a yoke on Esau's neck and that yoke 
was something that Jacob controlled, but when Esau got to the point and realized that I don't have to hate him to find comfort, I can end up finding comfort in the Lord, I can forgive my brother, and when I do, I will be throwing this yoke to the ground. And that yoke no longer will hinder me, no longer will hold me back, but I'm going to be able to walk in freedom. I'm going to not have a ceiling on what I can accomplish and what I can do. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me the strength. But I need to be able to forgive my brother first. Now, had Jacob asked forgiveness? Like, no, no. Esau just figured it out on his own and the Lord working on his heart. Jacob didn't do anything but just shake in his boots and be absolutely fearful. It's like the Lord had told him, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to go back to that land. You're going to possess that land. But hanging on to that word, that sometimes is a challenge for all of us. When we look at the circumstance, hanging on to the word of God that says, you can do it. I trust me, I'm saying, do it, go, go, go. I've got your back. I am protecting you. Now, go. But we see the circumstance, and that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. My brother's got 400 men with soldiers. I know that he's going to cut me up. I'm going to get killed. But God's faithful. God is so faithful. Sometimes a situation that looks absolutely impossible We just have to resort to the word that says, with God, nothing is impossible. Everybody say that with me. With God, nothing is impossible. There's power in the spoken words. There's power in blessing. And there's power. (laughs) Our power comes from God. A loving, promising, awesome, all-powerful God. Oh, thank you, Jesus.